lot of people joined and a lot of people joining. Let me uh, let me get us going this morning on a on a presentation I've really been looking forward to. I've been um, kind of monitoring. I suppose like a lot of people, you hear a lot about the um, St. Louis River area of concern, and you know a lot is going on up there. But I only catch snippets of what's going on at different times, and and I know that um, probably like everyone listening here, when you drive to Duluth, you come over the over the hill, coming down in Duluth, and you get this fantastic view of the estuary there and the and the lake beyond, and it's so striking. And every time I do, I think of the work that's been done there. Um, to remediate the uh, the St. Louis River area of concern and all the work that is still going on. And so it's it's with real pleasure that I introduce our consortium of speakers today to tell us about um, what the history and framework is of the St. Louis River area of concern and the remedies that are being applied to contaminated aquatic sediments, habitat restoration projects, and how that is all funded. Um, we have three great speakers today that are going to tell us about this. Barb Huberty, uh, the St. Louis River Area of Concern Coordinator, and Larray Leto from the MPCA, St. Louis River Area of Concern Contaminated Sediment Program Coordinator, and Jeremy Pinkerton from the Minnesota DNR, who is with us to talk about uh, restoration um, as a pro uh, restoration project manager. Barb was, um, before this, she was director of the Legislative Water Commission, helping legislators understand Minnesota's water issues. And, and before that, she served as the environmental manager for the city of Rochester and as an environmental analyst for Olmstead County. She obtained her BS degrees in biology and secondary science education from the University of Minnesota and along the way, she taught a variety of science subjects to students in grades 7 through 12. Lorray um, is going to tell us how contaminated sediments are remediated in the area of concern. She's been working in the St. Louis River Area of Concern program since 2017 and has been a sediment coordinator since 2019. She conducted research for the US EPA and was an environmental specialist for a local engineering firm doing work on the area of concern projects. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Augustana College and a Master of Science degree in Integrated Biosciences from the University of Minnesota. And then finally, but certainly not least, Jeremy Pinkerton, who is from the Minnesota DNR uh, as, and works as a project manager working on the uh, St. Louis River Restoration Initiative since 2021. He spent six years working as a fisheries specialist in the Duluth area, working on streams and rivers, including the St. Louis River Estuary. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in fisheries and wildlife management from Lake Superior State University and a Master of Science degree in evolution, ecology, and organism, organismal biology at Ohio State University. It is great to have you all with us, and uh, with that, I am going to hand it over to you guys to tell us more about this um, great project. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, you guys are going to be amazed, I think, about all the content that we're going to share with you today. And um, I just want to let people know if you're not familiar with Duluth, you're looking at an aerial photograph of the St. Louis River estuary. Uh, this is the lake down here. This is Superior, Wisconsin. This is the estuary, which narrows into the river farther up, and Duluth is over on this side. Um, we'll have a time for questions at the end, so if you've got questions along the way, please enter them in the chat, and then Mark or Brooke will moderate for us as we go on. Um, sure, now we're not going to advance. There we go. Um, so we're going to just kind of uh, jump around here. I'll start by giving you kind of an overview of the program's history and its framework. Then Larray will get into the technical details of how we go about remediating the contaminated sediments. And then Jerry, Jeremy is going to pick up from there and talk about how we're um, proceeding with restoring habitats in the estuary. And then we'll come back to me um, so I can explain how we're making progress toward delisting. 
So we were established as a Great Lakes Area of Concern in 1987 by the Great Lakes Water Quality Act, which was a binational um, act signed by the US and Canada. And the entities that were selected as areas of concern um, had to meet the criteria of having significant environmental damage from local actions. And those were all based on historic damages that happened before environmental laws were in place. We are one of 43 Great Lakes AOCs. We're one of 31 in the United States. And we are a bi-state um, AOC with Wisconsin. Um, I think one of the things that's kind of unique about how this program evolved is the fact that, um, you know, at the end of the kind of the World War II industrial era, a lot of production along the Great Lakes cities ended and we became kind of a rust belt. And a lot of those, um, or those organizations or municipalities or industries um, went belly up and so they're are not responsible parties under the Superfund program for a lot of the areas where there were damages. So there were a lot of orphaned um, pollutant, pollution sites across the Great Lakes. And so this uh, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative was established to help those Rust Belt communities recover both economically and environmentally. Um, we are the largest U.S. tributary to Lake Superior. We're also the largest estuary on Lake Superior. Um, for those of you who have been to Duluth, we're, you've seen the shipping activity. We're the largest freshwater port uh, inland. Um, and although this gray area represents the entire area of concern, geographic area that um, we're working in, we are working primarily within the lower 39 miles of the river in the estuary. And you can see in the map on the right, um, the locations of all of our projects. The red sites are the remediation sites that we're still actively working on. The light green sites are the um, restoration sites that are still underway. The dark green are the location of our wild rice seeding areas and all of the purple sites are the projects that are done. So one of the things that's unique about this program is that um, it really is just focusing on the legacy impacts. Um, and that creates a lot of confusion for people because they think that we should just be an area of concern forever so that we can continue to get federal money. Um, but that's not the case. We're looking at just those issues that are related to that unregulated pollution and that had happened before, in our case, the Clean Water Act and are addressing those legacy impacts with the understanding that once we finish our responsibilities, we know that there will still be problems here that will need to be dealt with. And we talk about those as modern impacts. And so other existing agency programs will continue to do work in this area and we'll have to do a handoff um, of our work once we get delisted. I also want to note that this is a voluntary program, um, but it has a huge benefit of having the incentive of a lot of federal money coming in in order to get the areas of concern to participate. So in, in our area, excuse me, we have really two um, main um, issues that we're dealing with. We're dealing with contaminated sediment and lost habitat. And as most of you, I think, are familiar, there were decades of both industrial and municipal waste that were discharged directly into the St. Louis River for a very long time. Um, you can see the list of the types of industries that were here. And, you know, that's one of those things where people didn't really understand that there might be some long-term damages because if you put something in a river, it just goes downstream, right? Uh, out of sight, out of mind. And similarly, we had a lot of lost habitat, primarily aquatic, open water aquatic habitat, um, where wetlands were dredged in order to create the slips where the ships dock or else they were um, filled in order to create the docks where uh, the adjacent industries were built. And so there was a tremendous amount of landscape change that happened really after the Duluth Ship Canal opened and um, ships could get into the protected harbor. So we figure we lost about 3,400 acres of shallow aquatic, shallow open water aquatic habitat during that time frame. 
the way that the um, work here is structured is that we have what are called beneficial use impairments. Those are very specifically defined through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. There are 14 of them. Only nine apply here. They're different than the 303D um, Clean Water Act impairments. Getting weird note here. Fine. Um, and so these nine impairments, beneficial use impairments, or we call them BUIs, we'll be talking about each of them as we move forward. We've removed three of them already. One is in the hands of EPA right now, waiting for their approval for removal, and the rest will have to wait until we finish our construction projects, and we anticipate that happening about um, 2027. So as Mark noted, this has been going on for a long time. Oops, sorry about that. There we go. So planning started as soon as we were listed. The first remedial action plan was produced in 1992 and the impairments um, were evaluated at that time. And then after that came initial um, recommendations for action. There was a habitat plan that was produced that did an evaluation of all the habitat issues from which the habitat priorities were set so that we could select which projects um, we'd pursue under the AOC program. We didn't write our removal targets until 2011, and then our first comprehensive remedial action plan was produced in 2013, and that um, identifies what the um, impairments are, what the targets are to remove those impairments, and what management actions will be needed to remove to reach those targets so that we can remove the BUI. So right now we have one AOC, nine BUIs, and we have 80 management actions that are distributed across those nine BUIs that we need to complete in order to have the removal. We update our wrap every year. There's always an opportunity for public comment. It's an adaptive management plan, and um, it's really been working quite well for the last decade here. Uh, just briefly, I've, if someone doesn't know what an estuary is, it's the place where waters meet and mix. So in this case, the St. Louis River water that's flowing downstream meets with Lake Superior water that is moving upstream during um, SASH events, which happen when we have sustained high northeast winds. So that middle estuary zone is a mixing zone um, of warm water and cold water. And it really provides great, um, it's a great biological engine for this area. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important. It's where we have most of our um, critically imperiled marsh habitat because it acts as that nursery area. It is really a productivity driver for Western Lake Superior. There have been over 230 species of birds documented here, and Audubon has named it an, an important bird area because it's so critical to migration. Um, there's over 40 native uh, fish species. It's the home to, the, uh, to a lot of wild rice that was the reason the Ojibwe migrated here. It's um, become a recreational hotspot, so it's just a really important resource both for Minnesota and Wisconsin, but also the region. There are a lot of people involved in this. Back in the early planning days, there were over 70, that's seven zero, different organizations that were involved in helping to set up the framework for this work. Now that we're at the implementation stage, the number of active partners is greatly reduced. We have four coordinating agencies, the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, the PCA, the Minnesota DNR, and the Wisconsin DNR. And then we also have others that are providing administrative, technical, and outreach support like US EPA, which is our big funder, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, NOAA, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, US Geological Survey. And then locally, we have two important partners. The St. Louis River Alliance is our citizen action committee, and the Minnesota Land Trust is I would say DNR's right-hand <laughs> organization helping with a lot of the restoration projects. 
And also the public is really an important partner in all of this work as well. And they are quite engaged here on this work. And we provide all kinds of opportunities for people to learn and lots of opportunities for providing feedback and participation. Uh, we have public meetings and, and comment periods and community events. And we have a million different ways that we try to get information out about our work. Um, we've got great local media participation here, and St. Louis River Alliance is one of their um, obligations under our contract with them. They take care of um, organizing particular events and doing our social media. And then within our own agencies, we all have our own websites, and um, you know we utilize Gov Delivery, obviously, and then we've got some great story maps. So if you want ever to look at the details about any of these projects, go to the PCA website and type in St. Louis River Area of Concern and you'll find buttons for the habitat story maps, which show both Wisconsin and Minnesota projects. And then also we have one for the sediment um, story maps that show just the Minnesota sediment pro um, projects. Funding is quite the puzzle here. We um, really look for every available source of funding possible to do this work. Um, it's not just the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, but that's a huge part of it. Um, here in the harbor, there's a tax paid on cargo that um, generates money to do maintenance in the harbor, and that is called the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. We've leveraged that by utilizing um, navigational dredge materials. In, even FEMA has gotten involved in paying for some work over in Wisconsin. On the non-federal side, there's huge contributions from the private side, Natural Resources Damages Assessment Trust, cities and townships, and then with the state, we have our bonds and our environmental funds, plus our Land and Water Legacy Act, Clean Water Funds, and Outdoor Heritage Funds. Um, so we use every available resource that we can and when we get that money, it's designated to a project and we can't shift it around. This is um, just showing expenditures only for Minnesota's remediation and restoration projects. And it's a combination of both um, actual costs for completed projects and estimated costs for our remaining projects. And I think it's really um, what's telling about this graph is that you can see that the amount of private money contributed is almost equal to the federal amount. And then other big chunks are the Minnesota bonds and then the Clean Water Land and Legacy Act has provided a nice chunk as well. And then all those other sources fall into that last slice. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Larray to give us some details about how we do the remediating process. All right, thanks Barb. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk you through, um, as uh, Barb mentioned, some of our sediment remediation projects here in the St. Louis River area of concern. So um, everything I'm going to be talking about is uh, certainly done by a team. We have uh, project managers and technical experts at PCA, but we also are working with engineering and archaeological and real estate and uh, a whole host and environmental specialists and biologists from the Corps of Engineers and EPA and from private firms as well to do this work. So um, sort of the remediation process here, and I see several remediation folks on the phone who kind of know and, and go through this, is that for each one of these sites that was identified as potentially an issue in the St. Louis River, we go through a period of time where we do site assessment and we determine whether the site needs attention or not. Are there contaminants of concern at a level where we, we need to do something? And when we identify those sites, then we go further and do a remedial investigation. We really dig down into the details of that site to characterize it fully. And then we move on to doing a feasibility study. We basically say, what could we do to address this site? Um, what 
and we try to map out everything that's going on there with all the different options and the ways that we could address them. And there's a little snippet of sort of an infographic that we've put out because the next step is to go to the public and our stakeholders and say, you know, we have an issue at this site, we have these contaminants of concern, we believe we need to address them. Here are some different ways we can do that. And we look for feedback. We look for feedback from the public, from the adjacent landowners, sometimes from the landowners who own the property itself. Um, and we come up with the, the best alternative. And so then that next process is selecting our remedial alternative to move forward with. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we move on here. Then we move into the phases of remedial design. Once we've decided what we're going to do, we draw down into the details and we create plans that we can actually go out for bid with and do remedial construction. Um, Barb talked about all of those funding sources and for us at MPCA and, and Jeremy can talk about it from restoration pro, uh, side of things, but for the remedial side of things, the way that we do it at MPCA is that once we decide um, that we're going to clean up a site and we have a remedial design, we go to the US EPA Great Lakes National Program Office and we sort of pitch the project to them, right? Um, and we say, here's the project we want to do. Will you partner with us? And when they partner with us and we sign um, a project agreement, then EPA themselves will contract the remedial construction and we'll be partners, but EPA will do the large contracting. And then once construction is done, we'll move into a monitoring and maintenance phase for each, each site. Okay, Barb. Um, so what we're going to talk about a little bit is how we sort of group the sites we have. You saw Barb's big map with all the different sites. We have a grouping of sites where we aren't doing any further thing further. We've characterized them and we've decided, you know what, they don't re need remedial action. We are just going to monitor those into the future. Then we have sites where um, we place a remedial cap. And I'll talk more about that. Then we have a grouping of sites like Ponds Behind Erie Pier and Munger Landing where we're doing a full dredge and removal project. And then we have activated carbon amendment sites, which is kind of a new one for us and folks across the Great Lakes. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we have sites like our two super fun sites at the Duluth Inner Lake Tar site and the U.S. Steel Spirit Lake site where those sites are so large and so vast that they require multiple um, types of remedies. And the remedy we select is based on a site's physical characteristics, the magnitude and extent of contamination, the risk to human health and the environment, and how what the current and future uses are of the site. Okay, go ahead, Barb. So the first type of sites, and if you've been in Duluth over the last several years, you work in the Duluth office, you have seen us doing this. Um, these are remedial caps. So we have a grouping of sites in the Duluth Harbor that have industrial and commercial site use. They're right in this busy shipping harbor. These sites also have adjacent infrastructure constraints. They have dock walls next to them that are in many cases in they're, they're in various states of disrepair. Some of them are newer, like the one right in Minnesota Slip along the city's dock wall um, that got built as we were doing our project, but some of them have old cribbing, board and batten wall. They're just not a place where we could dredge up against. We would fail the adjacent infrastructure. Um, also in some of our industrial and commercial slip sites, we have depths to contamination 12 feet down. So the logistics of doing a full dredge and removal project and taking all of that contaminated sediment out of there, it's just not feasible. We can't dredge down 12 feet next to a sketchy dock wall. <laughs> and then, you know, what also happens in a lot of these um, industrial areas is that the contaminants are localized, usually on the inner ends of slips. They're, they're settled into the the very inner ends and their higher concentrations in in just localized spots 
But overall, as compared to other areas of the estuary, the concentrations of contaminants in the industrial areas tend to be a little bit lower and we have fewer bioaccumulating contaminants like PCBs, mercury, and dioxins and furans. So what we do in these areas is cap those contaminated sediments in place. We come in with 18 to 24 inches of clean fill and we cover the contaminated sediments then we typically will bring a layer of armor stone over the top so that vessel traffic, prop wash, uh, human activities out into the future don't disturb those remedial caps. So the contaminants are still there. Thanks, Barb. They're still in place, but we have covered them up and sequestered them. So this is the case in Minnesota slip, slip three, slip C, and the ASCON DSPA slip. We have done four of these in the harbor. Overall, we've succeeded in isolating about 200,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediments. We have dredged and removed hot spots of about 700 cubic yards, so just some very small localized hot spots. Um, we've removed about 20 tons of debris from the harbor in this process. We've used over 40,000 cubic yards of clean cover from the harbor navigational channel. So Barb mentioned that in the funding sources, this is material from the harbor nav channel that needs to get dredged and moved anyway for shipping traffic. We bring that clean material in and use it as a free source. And then we've brought in about 24,000 cubic yards of armor stone from offsite. All right, so the second set of sites we have are backwater bay areas. These are the ponds behind Erie Pier and Munger Landing areas. These are, um, you can see the ponds behind Erie Pier here is right under the interstate bridge. You wouldn't even know it's there unless you look down. Um, and then the Munger Landing is at the busy Clyde Avenue access. These sites are important for us and we are doing a sort of quote unquote, traditional remedial action here, where we are fully dredging out the contaminated sediments um, and restoring the sites. And the reasons we're doing that is we don't have the infrastructure constraints. Um, the contaminants are in larger areas of varied depth, sometimes quite shallow. We have bioaccumulating contaminants, PCBs, mercury, and dioxins, which have a much more direct human health risk and impact, and we need to get those out. And these are good quality habitat areas, and we don't want to leave those contaminants in place here. Go ahead, Barb. So at the ponds behind Erie Pier, we have already completed the dredging and removal of about 43,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediments. The ponds was a soup. A uh, hot spot of mercury, PCBs, PHs, dioxins, heavy metals, lead, chromium, cadmium. Um, we have uh, removed some adjacent upland soils and disposed of them as well as source control. We have brought in about 26,000 cubic yards of clean cover. So once we did the full dredge and removal, we brought in that harbor navigational material and placed a new cover for the bugs and the fish and the vegetation. And we um, put new armor stone around those industrial bridge piers to protect them moving forward. Um, we also opened the causeway between the two ponds uh, for fish habitat and we restored Shoppers Creek. And then Munger Landing is going on right now. This is our big project right now. This is at the Clyde Avenue boat landing. If you've been on the west end of Duluth, right in the Riverside neighborhood. Um, this site's of particular importance to us because we had to Tosca level PCBs right at the boat landing where people were coming into contact, kids, dogs. Um, this was really a high priority area for us. So the project objective here is a full dredge and removal of over 100,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment across 38 acres. We'll also be doing about eight acres of targeted habitat restoration next summer. And then we'll be improving that public boat landing, adding a sandy paddle sport launch and working with the city on their overall improvements. This is a $42 million project that is being funded by EPA uh, responsible private party and um, Wisconsin DNR and MPCA. So lots of partners in this one. Um, 
you can see here some pictures of us digging up the, the boat launch. Um, it's gone right now. So if you're in the area, stay away from the site. Um, the biggest accomplishment so far here is that we have succeeded in dredging and removing all of the Tosca level that's um, above the tox tos Toxic Substance Control Act levels of PCBs. Um, and those PCBs came uh, historically from a nearby uh, historic Westinghouse electric apparatus uh, repair facility. And so they, their uh, corporate successor is partnering with us on this project. But all of those PCB contaminated sediments at the landing have been removed as well as about 60,000 cubic yards of the overall project footprint. So we're about half done. Next summer we have the other half to do and then a lot of uh, fish habitat restoration when we're done. And then the last type of project I want to talk about, I know this is a lot today, <laughs> a lot of information, are um, our sites upstream at the Thompson Reservoir and at the Scanlon Reservoir. These sites are unique because they are both active hydroelectric power generation reservoirs. So as you can imagine, they have a lot of constraints but they also have um, historic contamination of dioxins and furans from the pulp and paper manufacturing upstream. And so as we've assessed these sites, we have determined they need attention, but how to do that is quite tricky. Um, we have geological constraints, um, we have bedrock, we can't just go in here and dredge in these sites. Um, access, feasibility of that, um, we have in a lot of cases six inches to up to two feet of soft sediments sort of between rocky outcroppings that don't lend themselves to dredging. Um, we have a uh, large surface area where these contaminants are spread and we have a lot of habitat considerations here um, where we cannot we don't want to dig them up. Um, likewise, we can't come in and cap these sites because we can't take away the capacity from Minnesota Power and um, the hydroelectric power generation. So, so what we've pursued at these sites is application of an activated carbon amendment. So this is a a uh, technology that's been introduced to sites over about the last 10 years. At the Scanlon Reservoir here, we are implementing the largest of its kind to treat dioxins and furan contamination. So you see these little pellets here? Those are pellets of sedamite, which is a, uh, a one type of activated carbon amendment product. It's about 50% carbon um, and 50% sand and clay by volume and weight. And Think of it as charcoal pellets essentially being placed on the bottom of the reservoir to come into contact with those contaminated sediments. The carbon binds to the dioxins and furans and um, renders them not biologically available. So even if they are taken up by the bugs and the fish, those contaminants can no longer bioaccumulate. They will pass through the organisms and come right back out. So while the contaminants are still there, they are not biologically available. And you could see when they're placed on the surface of the sediment here, they sort of bioturbate in over time. And we expect to get protection in that like top six inches or so of the sediment. Go ahead, Barb. So we are complete with the project in the Scanlon Reservoir. The Scanlon Reservoir remedial footprint was about 13 acres. So we selected that site to be a pilot project for the Thompson Reservoir, which we're working on the design for right now, which is 76 acres. So we applied this in the smaller site um, to address about 55,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment. So th what that meant was placement of over 200 tons of pellet activated carbon. Sevenson was the contractor here and used their proprietary placement method. And we also added over 5,000 tons of sand in the higher flows areas to help and create a new substrate layer. Um, and so we that's a very thin layer. It did not uh, affect the capacity. Scanlon is a run of river reservoir and um, we'll be anxious to monitor the site in the years to come to see, see how well we did. All right.
right, Barb. And then we have those couple of super fun sites that I mentioned where we have uh, implemented multiple types of remedies. Um, so today we'll talk about the U.S. Steel Spirit Lake site. Uh, the Duluth Inner Lake Tar site was remediated back in the years 2010 to about 20, 2012. Uh, but here at U.S. Steel Spirit Lake, the EPA and their partner, U.S. Steel, along with their consultants and engineers and contractors, have uh, dredged and removed or dredged, removed, and capped uh, 1.3 million cubic yards of contaminated sediment. So that is, that is massive. <laughs> it is a very large undertaking. They have also capped an additional 850,000 cubic yards. So those numbers in comparison to the other sites I just talked about, we're not even on the same level here. This is orders of magnitude more. Um, about 12 acres are enhanced natural recovery areas. Well, we will be kind of watching those and monitoring those in the years to come. Two confined disposal facilities were created on site to uh, manage the contaminated sediments. So while some of the highest contaminated sediments have been disposed of off-site, the vast majority of the sediments that have been dredged at the U.S. Steel Spirit Lake site are being housed on site in confined disposal facilities within the Superfund site itself. There are also monitored natural recovery areas, as well as upland capped areas, areas where they graded and capped, Barb is pointing out. Um, so lots of different remedial strategies uh, negotiated with a whole host of partners along with the Fond du Lac Band. Um, and the site should, when it's complete, uh, succeed in the restoration of about 138 acres of aquatic habitat. Jeremy and others at Minnesota DNR have been an integral part of these projects as well, negotiating that. Um, in case you want some sticker shock there, that total project cost of $186.5 million to do this project to date. So. And then the last piece for me is to mention that, uh, as you can imagine, all of these projects and all the work over the years generates a massive amount of data. <laughs> and in order to manage this data early on in the St. Louis River AOC process, um, people had the vision to uh, create, well, NOAA has a database called Diver. And the St. Louis River AOC is using NOAA's diver database as the place, as the repository for all of our data. So data is accessible to other scientists through the site, but all of us can put things there. So PCA is putting things there, Minnesota DNR, Wisconsin DNR, as well as all of our federal partners at EPA, NOAA, USGS, Fish and Wildlife Service. So it's a nice place where everything is going. Um, all of the data gets QA, QC'd, and um, over time, MPCA here is also trying to replicate this um, and have a copy of the diver data in-house in our Equus database so that someday if NOAA no longer funds diver and we don't have that, that we have a copy internally. So um, massive undertaking by the Minute folks and the PCA staff to, to do that. Um, we also have a public interface um, through Tableau of the diver data. So Sarah Yost internally manages that right now. And so it allows us to have that and host that on our PCA website so that folks can, a link from our PCA website to the Tableau server where the diver data diver data is uh, spatially represented. So that's really helpful because it allows the public to go in and take a look at that data at any time. I also go there regularly <laughs> because it's the easiest way for me to access it as well. All right. Robin, thanks, Larry. We're going to uh, transition from remediation to restoration. So while the uh, Pollution Control Agency has taken the lead on, on much of the remediation work in the estuary, the Minnesota DNR, uh, on, the, on the Minnesota side anyway, the Minnesota DNR has taken lead on, on a number of the restoration projects. So these are, this is a list of the, the, rest, the 12 restoration projects that, that we are working on within the estuary. Uh, the green arrows signify that the project's been completed. 
the IPs are in progress and the D is in development stages. So as you can see, we within these 12 different uh, projects, we have a variety of different uh, desired conditions that we're looking for. A few of these do have contaminated sediment where remedies were applied. There's been wood waste removed uh, from where there used to be sawmills, restoring shorelines and uh, restoring fish and, and, and bird habitat and things. And you can, you can see the list. I don't, don't really need to walk all the way through that. But OK. So these are a number of the techniques that we use in total. Uh, within the wrap, we're looking to restore about 1,700 acres of fish, lost fish and wildlife habitat. And as Barb mentioned in the opening, you know, the historical component of, of losing fish and wildlife habitat, we are looking at habitat loss due to, due to dredging, filling, and uh, uncontrolled wastewater going into the uh, industrial and, and municipal wastewater going into the system. Those have all been taken care of, so now we're, we're going in to, to clean up and, and restore things. So a number of these projects involve multiple different components. As we mentioned before, uh, can be things from restoring beach dunes to building underwater habitat with either dredge material or material that's being moved around, or uh, the navigation dredge material or moving material around within site. Done some stabilizing stream channel work, seeding wild rice, improving fish passage in streams, and like we mentioned before, evacuating uh, large quantities of wood waste. So we're gonna take a closer look at a few of these projects. And uh, this project here is the 40th Avenue West. It's a remediation to restoration project. This one was led by the PCA. It is connected as you can see, you're in close proximity to the ponds behind Erie Pier, which uh, Lorraine talked about previously. So in 2017, 2018, dredge material, navigational dredge material was used to create a, a shoals within the estuary, uh, within 40th Avenue. And you can see those in the right-hand side map. The yellow are the shoals and green spots are islands that were, were constructed in there. In 2000 and 2003, two uh, came back and placed a biomedium on these places. So the biomedium would be uh, sed sediment that is mixed with seed, whether natural or manufactured. So the westernmost shoal and the southern half of the easternmost shoal had material from a Kingsbury Bay restoration project that was led by DNR. Some of that material was brought down to 40th Ave and placed on these shoals. I thought it would be a good source of seed material and also have some good organic matter to uh, allow seeds to grow. And then in 2002, a manufactured biomedium was placed on the, re the remaining shoals. And that is consi that consists of dredge material, uh, navigational dredge material from by the superior entry mixed with uh, seeds from eight different species of aquatic plants. So this one sets up really neat. We have a remediation project, but we'll also be able to compare um, how the performance of a natural biomedium versus a manufactured biomedium. So this is a really nifty one. One of the projects that the DNR is currently leading, this project is, is ongoing, is the restoration of Perch Lake. Perch Lake is historically a backwater bay to the estuary. Its connection with the estuary was greatly decreased first by the construction of a railroad in the 1890s and then highway 23 in the 1930s so now that there's only a two foot by four foot uh, opening that connects perch lake to the estuary um, so this project is looking to restore some bathymetry for for fish uh, and other aquatic animals we're also build, constructing some hemi marsh within this project and then we're going to restore the connection to the estuary. So over time, materials had, had deposited back here and, and made this shallower. So that's what a lot of the dredging is about. And then we're going to install a 12 by, by 18, or 12, that's all right, 12 by 16 foot culvert under Highway 23. So the dredging component of this project is mostly completed. Uh, there's a small portion between the old railroad, which is now a city trail, and Highway 23 that will be completed in the winter likely next month. 
Uh, our contractor thought that would be easier um, to do when everything's frozen. Jeremy, can you explain what Hemi Marsh is and why it's so important? Yeah, so one of the one of the components of this project, as I mentioned, is constructing Hemi Marsh. So Hemi Marsh literally means uh, half water. So this is constructing open water channels within a mostly cattail dominated wetland to try to enhance the habitat for secretive marsh birds. One thing that we're doing with this, so most of this material, about 60,000 cubic yards of the material that we've dredged from Perch Lake has been brought off site. The stuff from the Hemi Marsh isn't being brought off site. That's being piled in areas or was piled in areas near where these channels are to help diversify the habitat as well, give, give um, areas for different species of aquatic plants to, or wetland plants to move in. And I would be remiss to mention that the all of the vast majority of the material that was removed from here is going to be beneficially reused or is being beneficially reused within the estuary. Some of it went to U.S. Steel, some of it's going to Munger Landing or for the reclamation of uh, non-ferrous mineland in Wisconsin. The last big construction project that we will be doing as part of the AOC is the Mud Lake uh, project. The project objectives of this one are well, we're investigating and removing uh, wood waste from sawmills, removing sediment invasive cattails, uh, improving the hydro hydrological connectivity. So similar to Perch Lake, this one has this one's a much a, a bit of a larger opening. It has a 40 foot or a 70 foot, excuse me, opening underneath the railroad, but only one opening. So we're looking to make another opening at, at the bottom edge of this picture. And then we're also looking at the potential to restore some of the Hemi and coastal marsh habitats here as well. So where we're at with this project, the conceptual design is completed. Pre-design sampling has, or a number, bunch of pre-design uh, sampling has been completed. A restoration site team has been developed to help evaluate options and we're hoping to start construction in 2024, 2025. Well, this kind of just looks at a bit of what the pre-design sampling for this project entails. There's geotech sampling in part because we are going to be working on that railroad causeway, looking at contaminant, potential contaminant issues with the sediment, looking for wood waste, uh, seeing what the bathymetries are like now versus what we have in that uh, concept design. We've been doing some, the, we're working with the Army, US Army Corps on this one. Uh, so looking at the hydrodynamic modeling as to what different sized openings uh, now it would be the top of top of the uh, colorful map over here would show and developing some design alternatives so we have kind of got a rough design of what that concept design would look like and it would be removing something along the lines of 300 cube 300,000 cubic yards of material which is probably a bit more than we'll be able to do. So now we're gonna start tweaking that, that concept design and, and coming up with some alternatives to what we can do, along with looking at different sized openings. And one of the other projects we're working on, not construction, is uh, wild rice monoman restoration. And this is being led by the Wisconsin and Minnesota DNRs, along with some great collaborative efforts from the 1854 Treaty, Treaty Authority, the St. Louis River Alliance, and the Fond du Lac band of Chippewa Indians. Um, so the plan calls for uh, implementing wild rice restoration over about 275 acres. So since 2015, there's been site preparation, which often involves uh, vegetation removal. There, every fall, there's seed broadcasting, monitoring the, the uh, 1854 Treaty Authority, monitors density, and acreage goals, and then we are also working on some goose control, so uh, herbivory control, with putting up exposure fences and doing goose roundups. So you can see the numbers for 2002, as far as there's about uh, 8,000 pounds of wild rice seed placed over 58 acres. All told, there's been about 68,000 pounds of wild rice seeded into the estuary over approximately 200 acres. All right, we're back to me. So I'm going to talk about how um, all of this work um, gives us some progress toward delisting. So I'll be talking about the, um, the that from the concept of the beneficial use impairment. So we have 
nine altogether. Um, three of them have been removed. One is very close to being removed. So we have five others that remain and they're shown here. And so all of those um, projects that Larray talked about, the remediation projects, fall into our restrictions on dredging bucket. We hope to complete all of those both in Minnesota and Wisconsin by around 2027. Um, all the projects that Jeremy talked about uh, fall into the law sufficient wildlife habitat, which we expect to have those construction projects done about the same time. As soon as those projects are done, then we'll be able to remove um, this uh, beach closings and body contact restrictions because we have three beaches where we have established either no swimming or warning signs. And as soon as the remediation is complete, then we can go through a process to have those removed. And then we'll have a, um, a task to document compliance with wastewater and stormwater permits. And then that one can be removed. But these other two will be removed sometime after that. And we don't really have a date other than it's going to be after we finish the removal of these because we're not sure what the length of the recovery period is that we're going to need um, to show that we've had some recovery in our Bentha community, nor do we know what kind of recovery period we're going to need to show that we've made um, strides on reducing restrictions on fish and wildlife consumption. So these last five are highly integrated and interdependent on each other. Um, the three that we've removed, I'll just briefly mention. Um, the first one we removed in 2014 was degradation of aesthetics. Um, I just love this picture. This is how bad it used to look like. One of the things that's a weird phenomenon about the AOC is that at most sites, um, the way they looked before we did our projects and the way they look after we did our projects is not very visibly different. Um, but Clearly, with the aesthetics issue, all of the oil slicks and odors and the scummy rotting grain um, materials that were floating around the harbor, harbor, those have all been resolved. So that UI was removed. Um, we also had um, a fish tumors and other deformities BUI that was removed in 2019. Back at the beginning of the AOC, there was a um, hypothesis that because of contamination and habitat loss, that we would have a higher incidence rate of tumors and deformities within the estuary as compared to unimpacted areas. But there was nothing to document that. That was just something people surmised. So a process um, was initiated to um, identify target species so we could um, answer our hypotheses, a, a reference population was identified, and then a method was determined to assess how um, migration might impact those fish because there's a lot of movement of the fish from the estuary out into the lake and back. And after all those studies were done, we were able to show that the tumor rates in the estuary were not significantly different from, from in the lake, and so we were able to remove that one. Similarly, with our excessive loading of sediment and nutrients BUI, which was removed in 2020, um, we were had had the same kind of thing. You know, before there was um, work to before the Clean Water Act was in place, again, people could just dump whatever they wanted wherever they wanted it. So the water quality was very poor. At one point, the river was basically anoxic, and the walleye fishery collapsed. Um, but then when the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District was built and this um, Superior Wastewater Treatment Plant was upgraded, those automatically provided water quality improvements almost instantly. Um, but there still was no uh, very scientific assessment of water quality over time to see um, how that anecdotal information played out with real data. So there were a lot of studies that were done. We collected here in this picture paleolimnological sediment cores to try and assess what conditions were like historically in the estuary and um, looked at gathering additional data and evaluating historic data and eventually were able to show that we are seeing significantly improving trends in um, sediments and nutrients throughout the estuary. So we were able to um, remove that. And in addition, in Wisconsin, they now have a plan um, to address uh, natural deposition of sediment from their clay-influenced bays. 
So we were able to remove that. And this is the one that's currently in um, EPA's house to uh, give us approval. Uh, we had a similar thing here where at the beginning, we didn't really have any assessment of our bird, fish, and aquatic mammal populations. So an assessment was made of those target species to determine what the population condition was. And um, out of that assessment came two habitat projects. One was in Wisconsin Point to develop a piping plover nesting habitat. You wouldn't think this would be a very attractive nesting habitat, but if you're a piping plover, apparently that looks like a very fine hotel. Um, and then also a huge project on Interstate Island to improve uh, habitat, nesting habitat for common tern. And then also we did an additional study on Lake um, sturgeon tissue because there was some question about whether the legacy contaminants were affecting their ability to recover that population. And that study showed that the legacy contamination was not a cause for that. So we were able to show that those target species aren't limited by legacy impairments. And that's why we were able to put that into uh, EPA's hand. Uh, these two, Lorraine and um, Jeremy have already talked about. So um, the BUI-5 are restrictions on dredging. That's all the remediation projects. As soon as those projects are constructed, we'll have met the re removal targets and can uh, remove that BUI. Same thing with BUI-9, our loss of fish and wildlife habitat. As soon as those projects are done, we can move forward with, it, with that removal. Um, the beach closings and body contact restrictions I mentioned, in addition to the fact that we've got three projects that need to um, be completed in order to address the no swimming and warning signs, we did um, do a Barker's Island beach restoration, we being Wisconsin DNR, because um, that was a beach that had historical E. coli impairments. And then we also studied microbes at closed beaches for the controllable human sources through a microbial source tracking study and those remaining beaches are all within the city of Duluth and there's now a Duluth Beaches TMDL and the city is um, working to address those um, issues. So uh, we've got our last task which is to do our um, compliance assessment when those other projects are completed and we'll be able to remove this one. And probably one of our last ones to remove will be our um, fish consumption advisories. Again, we're only addressing the legacy contamination that's contributing to those. So we've had studies to deal with um, PCBs in fish tissue as well as mercury in fish tissue. And some real cutting edge isotopic science has been done here to um, segregate total mercury from the three sources being legacy, watershed, and precipitation sources so that um, we are quite confident, at least I'm quite confident, that the mercury fish consumption will still remain uh, because of modern sources, but we will have done our part to address the legacy sources. And as we get our contaminated sediment sites completed, the PCB issue should go away. So we're um, hoping to see some recovery in that after we finish our projects. And then our last BUI, which looks at degraded benthos, which is assessing how well the um, critters and the plants right at the sediment surface are recovering. Um, it actually has only one management action, and that management action is to go to all of our, um, not all of our sites, to 14 of our sites and assess how well the benthos is recovering. Showing here, we don't need you up there, sorry. Well, let me move you. There we go. Um, so before construction started, we did an assessment of macroinvertebrates and macrophytes across the estuary. And as each project is completed, we're going to go back and do a reassessment to, so that we can show um, how that's changed. And 
this is just a really great visual example of the volume of data that's being collected. So this is just the benthic data, but we have similar coverage um, with respect to sediment characterization across the estuary. And this um, gives us a lot of confidence that we're going to be able to show recovery um, trends and rates throughout the estuary. Um, right now, four of the 14 sites have been completed. And as other projects are done, we'll continue to move uh, forward with those assessments. Uh, for each assessment, we've got something called a trimetric index that um, is a calculated value that defines quality of the benthos. But in addition to just doing that numerical calculation based on the sediment and, uh, or excuse me, the bug and vegetation samples, that's also being processed spatially, like in this example of 21st Avenue West. So you can see that before the project, this was the condition in 24th, 24th Avenue or 21st Avenue West. And this is the post construction condition right now. And we'll do another sampling here in a couple of years and, and see how it's further recovering. Um, interestingly, this is the location of the Western Lake Superior Sanitary District. So there's always a huge amount of flow from their um, effluent discharge pipe that's coming through here. Um, and then twice a year at the end of March and at the end of September, we go through our list of management actions and identify um, what the status of them is, what we accomplished during the last six months and what we're going to accomplish for the next six months. So our status of management actions complete right now is 51 out of 80 management actions or 63.8%. Um, given the work that's been going on this last summer, a lot of it, which will wrap up next year, we'll see a big jump in that next year. So we're making great progress. Um, and one of the effects of this is that the um, economic and environmental revitalization of the estuary is already happening, even though we can't, um, even though they're not always visible results, here are some really great examples of tangible results. So for those of you who've been to Duluth and know where Bayfront Park is, this is um, Slip 2, and this is the Pier B resort, excuse me, that was developed. Um, and one of the reasons it developed there was there was confidence that the estuary was going to be cleaned up and this would make it a very inviting waterfront and it's proven to be an excellent business investment um, for this group. And another example is the National Water Trail. So the St. Louis River Estuary National Water Trail was designated by the National Park Service and um, those types of recreational um, designations are really important because they draw in uh, additional tourism into the estuary. So now we're not looking at tourism in Duluth, just focused on the lake, but that there's a lot of interest in the estuary that's driving some um, additional investments in West Duluth. And then we're also doing a lot of work so that we can um, sustain St. Louis River efforts once the AOC is delisted. Uh, there will still be improvements to be made and projects to be done. And this is just an example of how we're going to make sure that these investments, um, that we don't go backwards on them. The um, Clean Water Act enforcement that we have to do for any permittee, it will be helpful, as well as the long-term monitoring and maintenance plans that we develop and implement over time. Uh, the city of Duluth is a highly engaged stakeholder with us. They have a natural resources management program plan for the city, but it um, really focuses on a lot of estuary resources. They've designated the St. Louis River as a natural area, and they've established a plan to develop a long, long trail um, along the waterfront in West Duluth called the Wabaja Shikana, which um, is the Jibwe for Martin Trail. And that trail will um, not only, the trail will be developed, but there will be a lot of interpretive elements focusing on history, nature, and culture um, that will draw people to the area. There is a newly forming Lake Superior Headwaters Sustainability Partnership that will um, continue this collaborative effort long into the future. Um, both Wisconsin DNR and Minnesota DNR are, are already pr 
pursuing habitat project proposals under uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Act Focus Area 4 fund. Uh, the Lake Superior Reserve in Superior is working with us to help establish a long-term monitoring plan for the estuary. There's a habitat work group that's been engaged here for decades, and they are right now um, working on updating the habitat plan from 2002 to, to our current conditions and also updating the wild rice plan. Um, the St. Louis River Watershed, one water shed when part or what is it one watershed one plan initiative is underway and that'll be updated in 2020 2033 at which point we hope they'll include the estuary uh, the st louis river alliance is the lead on implementing the national water trail plan we're doing a lot of work in-house to um, make sure that data and documents will be accessible into the future because once we delist all the program staff will cease to exist in this program uh, there will be a new Lake Superior Lakewide Action and Management Plan in 2025, which will um, be the place where any other additional goals for the estuary will be set. And as another example, Minnesota Sea Grant, um, every two years they send out um, RFPs for research proposals and they've established some research priorities for the estuary. So lots of good work is happening to make sure that we continue this work. So we have um, all our contact information here. You're welcome to um, contact any of us at any time, but I'm gonna hopefully stop sharing here. Barb, I did put the um, website, the St. Louis River AOC website uh, link in the chat for folks. Thanks. Uh oh, I lost my. Uh, oh, there it is. Holy moly. So we did have a few questions in the chat, but it looks like Lorraine's addressed uh, them. So we had a question about those pellets um, that has already been yeah. addressed. I don't know if you wanted to talk a little more about that. I was just going to show something in case anybody else was interested. So Liz had asked a question about what happens to the activated carbon pellets. And um, I had responded to her, I see she had to log off by now, um, that, uh, that they break apart within minutes of their application. So if you can see, can you see the picture I'm showing? Mm -hmm. So these are the catch pans that we put down on the bed of the sediment. So to help us measure, hey, are the pellets actually reaching down into the sediment layer? And then what do they look like? This is about 15 minutes after application. So this is only capturing those pellets. So those pellets fall to the bottom. And then the portion of the pellet that is sand and clay sort of dissolves and breaks away from the carbon fraction. It sort of stays there as this like very thin muddy layer. The carbon will bioturbate um, into the top layer of sediment over time but via the benthic organisms. And then that sand and clay layer may also sit there and it may, um, it helps provide a new layer, but it also may, may travel um, over time. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, and I um, was curious as well of um, how do you know how much of this that you need to use? Is it based on the amount of contamination you're seeing? Or is there some equation that you use? How do you, yeah. how do you know how much you're going to need to do the job? Yeah, I didn't have time today to talk about it, but because this was a pilot study, what we did is, you know, in our feasibility study, we said we think this would work, but um, we worked with the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA to hire a firm. Um, we used Anchor QBA, and they did a series of bench scale testing. So they spent about a year where they went out to the Scanlon Reservoir, they got sediment, they took it back to the lab, and they played around with different um, concentrations, 2%, 4%. They used powdered activated carbon. They used granular activated carbon. Um, um, and that's how we decided and modeled the right percentage, the right dose by volume and weight of carbon, and then how to actually apply it. Now we're doing that and designing that and scaling it up for Thompson. And we actually have to use a higher dose because we have um, we have less uh soft fewer soft sediments it's a little bit more compacted with higher contamination levels so we are dosing that a little bit higher than scanland but yeah that's a good question 
Lorraine, right. one thing you didn't mention was the wastewater treatment that happens. Oh, yeah. So when we dredge all of those contaminated sediments, um, one of the yeah, one of the things I didn't talk about is the way that we're managing those is we're hydraulically pumping that into um, uh, geotubes. These are big, uh, basically fabric bags that house all the contaminated sediments, and then the water leaches out of those bags, and then that water goes through a water treatment plant, and we build them on site. They're temporary. They cost about a million dollars a piece. So the Spirit Lake project has one that has now been moved to Munger Landing, and then that one is there, and Ponds Behind Erie Pier had one that is now being decommissioned. And those uh, water treatment plants send the contaminated water through a series of filters, um, GAC and other varieties, and then we need to meet our water quality standards in order to discharge that water back out into the river. So that's constant water quality sampling and everything to ensure um, that what we're discharging back out into the river meets, meets our discharge standards. And that might have been uh, part of the question that I didn't get to that Jenny asked. So that was a good question. She was asking about concerns about leaching of dredged material. Um, and so we are managing the wastewater in real time, but then either the dredged material is going off site to a landfill or it's being managed in a engineered CDF on site where it's capped and we're monitoring that for, for leaching and things over time. And I just add that um, you know, in Duluth, we have a really short construction season. It's about four months long because we have to wait until the spawning periods are over. So we don't really get to start our in-water work until July. And oftentimes we're done by the end of October. So these projects are going fast and furious during those four months. And then we just shut down basically and have to restart the next year, which is why so many of them end up being multi-year projects. But um, the benefit is that like yeah. Munger Landing continues over winter, like Jeremy was saying, some Perch Lake work, ponds. So we try to do as much as we can over winter. So we try to do that disposal piece over winter or any wetland work we can, because like Barb's saying, our season is so short. <laughs> And for those that are spatially challenged, like I am, as Lorraine is throwing out, and Jeremy too, throughout those huge numbers, about thousands and thousands of cubic yards being um, removed and moved. Um, think about one dump truck load is about 10 cubic yards of sediment. So, um, you know, we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of truckloads of material that we're addressing through these processes. Yeah, and I see that Dan put in the chat that it, and it is definitely worth noting that all of these remediation and restoration projects that our team and Jeremy's team and folks are leading go through a mandatory EAW review. They go through DNR permitting, Corps of Engineers permitting and all of that. So it takes a lot of our internal staff at PCA and DNR to review these projects. They get another round of public comment during that phase too. So we, we permit and regulate ourselves as well. <laughs> And Lorraine, do you want to talk about cultural reviews and tribal coordination? Yeah, all these pro, um, projects also go through Section 106, sort of. Uh, Glenpo doesn't have to go through NEPA, but, and maybe Jeremy, you can talk about yours, but we go through 106. So everything goes through SHPO review. It all goes through tribal review. We have multiple tribes, not just the Fond du Lac Band, who are interested, along with the 1854 Treaty Authority. Um, our last few projects, anytime we have ground disturbance, we have a state certified archaeologist and a tribal monitor on site. So we are dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's as we try. Jeremy, are you guys? Same process. Same yeah, yeah I'd, I'd also mention that a lot of the work that's being done here is, and Lorraine talked about it with Scanlon, how that was a pilot project, but the 21st Avenue West project was also a pilot project on the beneficial use of navigational dredge materials. And that went through a huge, long study process before we actually um, got to the point of using that material to build shoals. Um, but it's been so successful that now the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is applying that throughout the Great Lakes. Um, similarly, the initial isotopic work that was done on mercury that was done here is now being applied across the Great Lakes, and we're getting a great data set to compare um, how different that combination of sources is across the Great Lakes. 
Um, and then Jeremy talked a little bit about biomedium, and I don't think Lorray mentioned that on her um, full dredge sites, they put cover down afterwards, and both of those steps are being done so that we have the right substrate and can basically um, create the best launching point for the um, macroinvertebrates and the macrophytes to reestablish. So we're hoping that that will um, cause the recovery to move along faster rather than just having to wait for natural recovery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to take several thousand cubic yards of that perch lake material Jeremy was talking about. They're dredging it out of perch lake. We're going to place it as the top dressing at Munger Landing to hopefully restart that. So, you know, we dredge a site out. We really kind of wreck it. And so um, bringing that biomedium from Perch Lake in hopefully will kickstart um, that growth like Barb was saying. Another question that folks have, we've thrown a lot of information at you. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, if you guys got more questions, just post them in the chat. Or you can just unmute yourself as well. Um, While we're question. waiting for others to post questions, um, Barb, a question for you. Um, having having been involved in a, in a large Superfund site in the past, I know what a challenge it is to coordinate all those activities with different agencies. That by itself is, is a huge project just by itself. Can you speak a little bit to um, your experience and, and the experience of the team up there just coordinating all of this work at different stages of, of completion that has to be an enormous challenge well i think it starts at the project management level i mean Lorraine talked about all the partners she's been working with on her projects and jeremy talked about the same thing on his projects is there are so many people involved that there's just a tremendous amount of time that communication and coordination within the team, but also with the public, because um, it's it, you have to have realistic expectations about what can be done and when it can be done. So there's um, we're constantly adjusting our communications for the longest time. The, the hope had been that we'd have all our projects done by 2020 and we'd be delist by 2025 and that's stuck in people's brains. Well, that's not going to happen. We'll be um, doing well if we delist by 2030. Um, so we're constantly adjusting our communicating and we are um, just coordinating with every single agency. I think the, the hardest thing right now that we're facing from a coordination standpoint is that Minnesota has done a really, really fantastic job of um, moving these projects forward. And we are a little bit ahead of where Wisconsin is. So um, if Wisconsin isn't moving at the same rate as we are, then um, we're going to be sitting here kind of in a holding pattern because uh, we can't remove those BUIs until they get their work done as well. So again, and, and do you do you find that the the public is really engaged with what's going on? Um, oh yes, <laughs> to a fault sometimes. Right. I don't know. <laughs> Um, we actually thought we were ready to remove our um, BUI-2 last April, and we didn't get it submitted to, until November because we had so much um, additional work we had to do to communicate to um, engaged professionals and citizens about what that meant. There was really a fear that... Um, well, two things. There was kind of a fear that we would never get to do any more population work here once we remove that BUI. And also there was a contingent of people that felt we, like we needed to wait until all the projects were done and we could document recovery, which wasn't um, part of the plan. But I think you have to think back to when we started, there was huge amounts of citizen engagement to develop the targets and to develop the management actions. And those citizens are still engaged and want to see this progress um, moving forward. And, and they are quite satisfied with the progress that, that's being made, but um, they're not letting go of their oversight role. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> I want to address, there's a couple of comments in the chat about how we plan for flood scouring and, you know, how uh, long-term flooding and things might affect. So 
we kind of handled it a little bit differently on the different types of sites. So in those industrial slips that I talked about where we have um, caps, those were modeled and I am forgetting the name of the model that we use, but um, the folks at the US Army Corps of Engineers, ERDIC, so they're, they're folks around the country who specialized in those things, modeled those caps and the armor stone, the size, the thickness, and all of those for both prop wash and um, erosion from potential flooding and wave action. So those are all modeled for that in that specifies the thickness of the cap as well as the thickness of the aggregate and the size and shape of that. Um, on our full dredge and removal sites at Ponds and Munger Landing, Ponds is really isolated, so it's not a big deal, but at Munger Landing, this is also the case at US Steel, those sites have full hydrodynamic models that USGS helped us with. And so um, placing that either the caps and the covers are engineered to withstand 100-year um, flood events, um, but also just general prop wash and wave action, sage flow. And then in those, um, in our two sites in the reservoirs, that's kind of what we're going through right now. The Corps of Engineers and the folks at Arcadis, who's the design engineer, they're using the, what's called the CAP SIM model, which is a new one to me. And they are working to model those for 100 year flood events and scouring that might happen and sort of anticipating how much loss we may or may not have of that activated carbon over time. So sort of depends on the type of sites, but we have hydrodynamic models for almost all of them, <laughs> and lots of help from USGS. I mean, climate resilience was a huge part of the design effort because obviously if you've been to Duluth, you know how we get blasted. Um, so using that 100 year storm event was just the standard, whereas in other kind of typical construction projects, the 25 year storm event is the standard. So, um, you know, material moves in an estuary and it will move and it was designed to, with, with that in mind. It also mentioned environmental justice, um, which is a big deal under the Biden administration. Almost all of our projects are in West Duluth, which is an um, economically um, impoverished area and has a, the, the largest number of underserved populations within Duluth. So one of the things we're doing right now with the St. Louis River Alliance contract is there um, going to be working with those neighborhoods to identify priorities that they establish for how they would like to become engaged um, in utilizing the estuary as the project's sites have been remediated or as habitat has been restored because potentially all of these projects provide a cleaner river that they can now access whereas for uh, several generations now people have been told to stay out of the river um, because it was unhealthy and now we want people to re-engage and so we're going to be working with neighborhoods to find out um, what kind of activities they'd like to be doing, what are their barriers to the activities, is it a fear of water, an inability to swim, a lack of access to paddling equipment, um, and poor access to the river. Um, getting transportation to the river. We just don't know yet. Um, what we're going to learn is are the big hurdles and what kinds of activities they would most like to pursue in their neighborhoods. But we do want to have a really concerted effort to reconnect people um, that live near the river with our um, restored and remediated sites. Um. Tom Schaub asked about funding, and I was going to type a response, but it'd be easier to say it. <laughs> so Tom, Barb showed those private funding sources. So the big ticket ones are that at the US Steel site, US Steel is paying over half of that out of pocket. So of that $185 million, there's a large, large share being paid by US Steel. Um, the Duluth Interlake Tar site, that was a super fun state super fun site that had, I believe, four private parties who paid. 
And then at Munger Landing, we have a voluntary party that is not a super fund site, but um, Paramount Global is the corporate successor to the Westinghouse Electric facility. And they have contributed over $10 million. I think by the time they're done, they'll be between 12 and $13 million on the project and they're doing an adjacent source control. It's a steal for them, right? Because they get to do this in a voluntary way where the state and feds also pay and they reduce their super fund liability and their natural resources damages liability out into the future doesn't mean they won't still pay more later but they're getting the bulk of their work done now with state and federal money so it's it's yep. kind of a big win-win for everyone and slip to um, was two million dollars of investment from um, the PRB the, folks the PRB folks and the Duluth Seaway Port Authority um, remediated a, a slip on their property and then Thompson Reservoir you're under negotiations right now with the private party for contributions so yep as I said earlier where there are you know we use every possible funding source and where there are still what would be responsible parties um, you know we want to maintain that polluter pays concept where the polluters actually still exist yeah and I don't know Jeremy if you have any on the restoration side um, but you have lots of partners too, state and local. <laughs> yeah, the value of the Clean Water Land and Legacy Act has been phenomenal to us. Um, the Outdoor Heritage Fund has been a source of funding for um, the restoration sites. They wouldn't typically have to provide a local share on those restoration sites, but we've gotten more money from GLRI and gotten the money faster because we've had a local match for um, on the MPCA side with the clean water funds that's um, also been used to contribute to our 35% share, but um, it also has given us a lot of flexibility to have money available when we need it and um, to adjust our schedules and needs as we go along. So having that flexibility has just been huge for us. I think we've exhausted everybody. Yeah, I was just gonna say we've got uh, just about one minute left and I don't know if there are any last uh, minute questions that folks have out there. Um, if not, uh, they do. there is the information that they shared with their contact info. So um, you can reach out to any of our speakers and get more information. Um, and then the website link was shared as well. So. Um, see no more questions. I'll just thank all of our speakers for joining us today and um, for taking the time that you had to to prepare the, the talks to share your great work with us. It was very interesting and very fun to uh, learn more about the progress that's being made and, and I look forward to, you know, the future results as well. So thank you to all of our speakers. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you.